All right. I'm going to be going live very often. We're going to be talking about the book of Isaiah. So we're going to be start talking pinpoint Iron Age events and stuff like that. So Iron Age transition events is going to obviously be major events between the events of Isaiah, right? So we're going to have the Assyrian movements, the Babylonian movements, the, let's say, the Grecian movements, which is going to be after the Media and Persia movements, and we're going to have the Roman movements. So those are going to be what we're going to look at. So we're going to, we're going to be really pinpointing looking at that. So we was looking at a lot of ancient stuff. Want to really get the foundation, understand on why the world needs to look at pinpoint um, hablo groups, right? Not just all types of chromosomes and all types of different combinations of all types of things, but to look at basically what makes humans human and basically what basically is what tied families together in its origin, in its story, right? So I think the season is right, right? It's time to get real deep into how the scriptures is illustrated. Basically, it's, what's the word I'm looking for? His own reality. It's, it's basically orchestrating his own reality. But I wanted to say that today because I want to have some room to talk about what we're going to be basically going into next and going a little bit into Isaiah because I think Isaiah is one of those books that not a lot of people go into in depth, but there are some really deep studies that I've seen on Isaiah. So I, we got a good understanding on, on the events that's going to happen around it, but it's one of those books that it does need a pinpoint, um, what's the one, what word I'm looking for, isolated understanding of what's happening here in Isaiah. Right. So we might have to align it with the prophets that also will be in his time. Right. Amos and stuff like that. Yeah. But Isaiah would be very, very interesting to go into pinpointly and, and talk about some of the interesting stuff. One of the one of the most interesting things I, I like about Isaiah is how it aligns with certain events that happen in the time of kings with a certain nation called basically Damascus. And Damascus, Damascus is basically interesting because when you start connecting, you know, his language, his, his connections by genetics and stuff like that, you start to realize something, even when the scripture kind of illustrates it. And you'll find it in the scriptures like Damascus, Syria, and stuff like that. And you'll start to notice that Syria has a lot of ties with a lot of things in scripture. So that's one of the things that I find really interesting. Let me just kind of let me just kind of quote some, something that I think I think is interesting from the scriptures on Syria. Let me find it real fast. Okay, so right here, it's the saying that when they had left in the Exodus, that they called themselves Assyrian, or Syrian, or Ar. It's basically I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go to also the strongs of it. Why this one is interesting. Deuteronomy 26 and 5. This is what he said to the people, right? So first, first let's, let's start from the top, because this was kind of interesting when you really think about it. So this is what it says, Deuteronomy 26 and 1. It shall be when you are come in the land which the Lord God gives you for an inheritance and possess it and dwell therein. So that's important. So he's, he's giving a message before they get to the land. So he's like, this is what you're going to do when you get to the land. But first he's going to have to do this before he gets to the land. He says that you shall take the first fruit of all the fruit of the earth. Now, now this is what's interesting because if you put this into understanding perspective, this is actually has some depth to what Messiah does. Why is this important? Because notice what he's saying, right? Soon as he gets to the land, Right. First, he got to take up all the seed of all the earth, which you shall bring of your land that the Lord your God gives you and shall put it in a basket and shall go to a place which the Lord your God shall choose to place his name there. So they go to the place and it says, and you shall go to the priest. So it's an exchange with the priests. Right. 
So it has to be in the hands of the priests, so the holy ones, right? That shall be in those days. Now, in those days, he says, right? Now, the complexity is, once we take a look at the complexity of what he's saying here, because a lot of people, when they look at the Old Testament and things like that, they don't really know that it actually has a lot of prophecies for its final fulfillment, right? That's in the time of his blessings. But watch what it, as it says, what it, when they go over, right? He says, it says, and you shall go to the priest that shall be in those days and say to him, I profess, I profess this day to the Lord your God that I am come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us and the priests, right? So they came to the land. It says, and the priest shall take the basket out of your hand. So the priests don't you know, exchange. There we go. Got all the seed of all the earth. And he's taking a basket. Right. So the priest take it and set it down before the altar of the Lord, your God. So the, the, all the seeds of the earth come into the altar of the Lord. Right. And you shall speak before the Lord, your God. So they stand at that altar. Right. They stand at altar and they got a saying to say they got. Now, this is what we got to pay attention to what they have to say at that altar. It says, and you shall speak and say before the Lord, your God, a Syrian. Now. You got to go into the root depth of when it's saying the Syrian, right? Let me just go over here and kind of go to this one because I think this is kind of kind of interesting when you really look at it. Let's make sure we pull up that one real fast. All right. Watch what it says right here. So a Syrian, but right here is actually going to be a, 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 a Arami or basically one of the um, brothers it's like a tie to one of the brothers of basically our facts, like one of the descendants, like later with our facts said, you got Elam and Lud. These are descendants of Shem. But that will also be one of the words that will be later translated to Syrian. So you will say like Aram rather. So they will come up and say it in the, in the ancient tongue, right? It's basically saying uh, Aram of Aram ready to perish or a Syrian ready to perish from my father and he went down into Egypt right Sojourn, sojourned there with a few and became a nation great and mighty and populous so you got to find an ancient you, this this family line will connect from Syria to Egypt that's why it was important to find like ties of that Syrian Egypt tie Right. And then it goes on and lets us know of their all the things they went through in the lands of Egypt and they left out after all the afflictions and everything. And this this gives us all the way to, to the last sum of it to the people are basically, as it says, right at the at the bottom where it says. When he talks about what the Lord is going to do and to make you high above all the nations, which he has made in praise and in name and honor. And that you. May be an honor, may a holy may may, that, may be an holy people, right? That you may be a holy people to the Lord your God as He has spoken. Now, what's interesting about this is that yes, someone can say this was fulfilled, as in the sense they were in the land, they were a holy people, everything was established, built everything, but it was prophesied of its fall. That's why it's important to know about these type of sayings. That it was if it was prophesied of his fall, then why would he pro why would he give the promise of glory when he knew that it was going to fall and then say in his end it was going to be more glorious? That's also important to know in the scripture that he tells you of the prophecy of his fall and then talk about it's going to be more glorious. And he talks about the prophecy of his fall while Moses is still living, while Moses is the one of the earliest prophecies because you can you can get it from Jeremiah, you can get it from Ezekiel. You can get it from Isaiah. You can get it from almost every place. But one of the earliest places we can see is right while Moses is walking, right in the song, what's called the Song of Moses. So right here at the end of Deuteronomy 31, there's a comes a Song of Moses. As it says, and Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. So here comes the song. He tells them the, the, the saying, right? Give ear, O heaven. And I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. He goes on and goes on and goes on. And he talks about basically how the people will basically fall off. 
go and worship idols, the anger of the Lord will rise up. He will be against them. But then he ends up saying something at the end, uh, basically, uh, basically a, re a return of the individuals. As it says, for the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself of his servants. When he, when he sees that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left, and he shall say, right? So remember, he's speaking to them while he's leading them out of Egypt. But he sees this is a song, a prophecy. And he says, he shall say, where are their gods, their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drink the wine of their drink offerings? Right. That's what happened in the time of the kingdom. So that means that the look back, right, the look back is looking back at what had passed. So the prophecy about them coming to the land with all the seed and then the blessing on the people of the land. This is a final fulfillment. We got to understand that the whole blessings of Deuteronomy, the whole outpouring of it, couldn't reach its final end because there was still a curse. Because the curse was too powerful for the blessings to be even seen. Because what's a what, think about it? If you get what's 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 going to be more seen? If you're in a curse, and you have a blessing within that curse. Or if you have no curse and you have blessings, if you have no curse and you have full blessings, but if it's a curse and you have a blessings, that's not good because then what are your blessings for? So probably for someone else is taken because the curse is, is there. And that's also what's part of the curse where it talks about they would have goods that be taken. But this is the complexity of the truth. So now we're realizing on this part where it's, where we know that only God heals, he's the only one that saves. But he says something right at the end of the whole phrase, at the last bit of the song. This is what he says. He says, rejoice, O you nations, with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render, what? A vengeance, right? And will what? For he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance for his adversaries and will be merciful. Here it go. And will be merciful to his land and to his people. Now, this is this is where it's important. Didn't he just prophesy a destruction of the peoples? So that means that that Jerusalem, that all that promise, all the blessings and glories, all in that city with all that gold from Solomon, all that. And then it fell and then it rise up again and it fell. That wasn't that wasn't it. That wasn't the promise that God had promised. God is not a God who makes a plan and can't accomplish it. God makes a plan and already plans for the mess ups. He already plans for the flat tires on the road while he's on, on the road. If you if, you, if we had to compare God to a person. This is how God would perform in every act of his act. If we had to compare God to a person, let's say he ha he had to get in a car. He will already know that somehow he's going to hit a pothole and the tire is going to pop. So he already calls somebody who's right a little bit right there and say, hey, have a wheel ready for me. Because right over there, the tire is going to pop. He already got a, a, something ready to fill in the gap. So that means that if he has something ready, first he had to give them what? Supplication. What does supplication mean? That means he had to give them something to supplify for something that will be the actual real reality. So that means he preserved the reality for a time that it would be acceptable. Right? That sounds familiar. Right? Doesn't that sound kind of like what the scripture be saying? Right? When it's talking about accepting things or something that's acceptable. In fact, he talks about something in the scripture that's exactly like this. Right? He talks about an acceptable time. In an acceptable time, right? In Psalms 69, 13, right? But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. In an acceptable time, O Lord, O God, in the multitude of your mercies, hear me. In the truth of your salvation. Now, do you now if he if he says that he's gonna hear you, there has to already be a sacrifice that's been given for him to be willing to do that. Because you got to remember, 
when Moses was walking, they was under a schoolmaster that gave them all statutes, laws and commandments, orders and, and pretty much all things to keep them in order, pretty much, right? Especially the Sabbath, especially the feast days, how they had to be kept, the exact measurements of the sacrifices and the complexity of how those sacrifices had to go, right? The washings, right? The sanctifications and all those things. But they never had what? Justification. So they had to constantly day by day sac sacrifice, right? Daily. They had to daily sacrifice or they had to be continuing in sin. Now, understand when I say that. That's why they had to, they had to do everything perfect. But if there was already a sacrifice made, that would be basically for sanctification and justification, then there's no need to go back to sacrifices. The reason why I say that, because I, I wanted to take this time to really express the change that happens within the first temple, the second temple, and us. So from the first temple and the second temple, that's what we're going to really get on. The, the information from the first temple, from the te first temple's rising to where it becomes a, 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 a kingdom. Because remember, Israel was not a kingdom until after the, after the events of Samuel. Israel was not a kingdom, nor shows signs in history as in, in um, academic work as a kingdom. So that means there's no... There's no Israel in Bronze Age. There's no Bronze Age Israel because they wasn't a kingdom then. There's only an Iron Age Israel, right? So that's, that's, why, that's why the information of Israel is interesting to find. But finding their ancient ancestors like Edomites, Moabites, Ammonites, right? Amalek's, all those different ones, the, the Moabites, right? Ammonites and whatnot. All those, all those different Shemites. If you find their culture in, the, in that land, like when you find physical, actual culture in that land, you start to realize that this is a very serious story. But remember, Israel was a, a group that rised up out of the pretty much pit of the lands of Egypt. So they was in, they was in slavery, right? But the Most High pulled them out of that land. So just like where we are now, that's what we're actually seeing. When you think of the complexity of the world we're in now, when you think about what you're seeing in the world today, if you really want to understand prophecy, if you really want to understand the reality of who you are, the reality of who we are as a, as a people, when you want to understand the depth of what the Most High wants, this book is open now. This book right now in our generation today, especially you, you as this is one of the biggest things that we need to know today. You as anyone who studies this book right now today, if you study this book and you study the geographic history and you study all those things, you'll start to realize something. This book has actual history in it. It has pinpoint history. But this is what it says. But you, O Daniel. Right. For God is my judge. Right. But you, O Daniel. Or you who God is your judge, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So if knowledge is, is increasing, this is a blessing, right? This is a blessing on us. All right. Probably some, mm, I wouldn't really know what sound, if something's up with the sound. I have to reset it. See what's up with that. Matter of fact, maybe it's this case. I'll try that. Try it without the case. But yeah, so so let's now let's 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 consider this. Let's consider this. If knowledge is going to increase, what does that mean for us? That means that we got to take part in the knowledge. Not that the knowledge is our salvation, but that the knowledge is available. So this is what this is a blessing for us. This is a very important blessing for us. So that's very, very important. Um, but if there's any sound problems, I'm going to have to reset, try to get it all uh, situated, because that's the goal. The goal, I'll just put it here.
All right. I hope you can see that text. Okay, so it sounds like it's good. I might have to do like a sound check real fast just to make sure it's, it's fine. That's the only thing about being on the phone. I can't really do a sound check because... All right, so so okay, so that's the goal. This that is the goal. The goal is to go over the book of Isaiah into its depth, into the historical understanding of it. Now, when we do that, we're gonna also be having to go kind of. The thing about Isaiah is it's very historical, al historically aligned. So we're gonna use Kings, a couple parts of Kings that aligns with it, because Hezekiah he's a real king. And there's a lot of different parts of the Kings of Chronicles that's, that writes about him and other prophecies that write about him. And also external sources like some of the kings of Assyria from the Sennacherib prism that writes of things of Hezekiah and other individuals. We'll talk about some of those things. But, but I'm glad you can hear. Good, good, good. That's, and that's, that's the goal. So the goal is, is to get deep in the book of Isaiah right i got some i got some notes set aside for it so it's going to be things from the iron age so it's going to be from the iron age as in let me go to a note here so I get this dot out so the iron age going all the way to the time of the the first temple to the second temple and we're talking you know how it goes like we're we're, going, we're talking sources get into the, the nitty gritty of stuff and getting a good understanding on what's, what's really going on. What's, what's the real picture of what's happening in these lands and the depth of it. So we're leaving Egypt. That's what's, that's what's happening. We, we were, we've been in Egypt for a long time. Even now, we've been in Egypt for a long time. I don't know if y'all y'all realize that, but for a long time on this channel, we've been trying to put the Israelites in Egypt why have we been trying to put the Israelites in Egypt? Because everyone's been trying to find out wh where are the Israelites. Is there any historical pinpoint information on the, on the Israelites? A lot of people don't notice. That's been a battle. Almost for a second, people were saying there are no Israelites. People were saying it. They were putting them in. They were putting them in wherever they want to put them, but could not prove what, which ones who are the, who are the pinpoint academic Israelites. And we we proved it. We pinpoint proved who are the academic Israelites. But so we're going to need these maps like this one because we're going to be going into the Old Testament, right, into the rise of the divisions of Israel and Judah. So we already got a good idea on who is who. So a lot of that is actually starting to come together. Right. Some of the interesting things that I said, what might be Edom. Right. e one b one c He's showing some interesting things with Arabia because Edom actually starts to bleed into Arabia, going into areas of Armenia. That's going to be kind of important for what the story of the biblical narrative shows, because from the time of this time, right, when Edom's right here. So when Israel comes out of the land of, as you see, Egypt. And just for, I'm, I'm also throw in a thought before I continue with this thought. We academically proven that the common knowledge of that Israel went into the land of this area is true. And I want everyone to know that the genetic people have these genetic ties to Natufians, right? So they got this, like, most of them have, like, a Yap lineage. But a lot of them sometimes have, like, an intermix in them. Because you got to remember that some, just small parts, part, part. so you might find, like, somebody who looked exactly genetically like someone who you may say is Israelite. Right? And they might have a different Y chromosome or some type of different chromosome. Don't even worry about why, why I say that right now. Why I say don't worry about it right now, in this time right now, if you come off as an Israelite, the reason why is because you're already genetically tied with the family of Israelites. That's what's important to understand. And the reason why I say that is because in this land, there was a group that came together real quick. Now, remember, they developed in the African plate, but they came out real quick, then swept around and went into this area here. And they're going to fill into these areas. Now, the most important thing consciously we got to understand is that this is a family, right? And when we're talking about a family, we got to also consider this is a tribe. So a tribe can can bring people in, but a tribe also is going to be in roots to the center of what that tribe would be. Like if it's a family tribe, 
you know, then it's going to be tied to around that family, right? And a lot of times, you know, it's just family tribes always have a king, usually. That's like your head of the family. And they'll usually make them a king or they'll make them a ruler or something like that. And family tribes will have a major ruler. And so Israel has their major rulers and everything, their heads of each tribe and everything. And we're going to note that in the lands of Jerusalem, they're all going to constantly go to that area. That's important to kind of get those artifacts, those different ties of different cultures around, because we don't want to be going around saying the people are in Africa and we can't prove it. Because there's a lot, there's a lot of, I'm not, I'm, and make sure I want to get this understood. I'm not bashing no one who's saying that. But I want them to know that they're, they're, they're kind of stepping in the way of the more critical information. If we're aligning the Natufian information that are, are Syrians and they go down the Levant and they go down into Africa, just like how we got ties with Israel as being the connection of being Syrians and all the way to lower Africa, we can get a good understanding on who they are. But we gotta we gotta connect those we gotta connect those two pieces. You know, those two pieces is major. Syria and the areas of Africa. That's a major those are major, major pieces in the, the scripture narrative. We can't be scared of pinpoint information. That's one of the biggest things that's gonna change our perspective on how these things go. So that's gonna be important. So we already remember we verified, you see this land over here with the Phoenicians. We already verified that these are going to be kind of like an outgroup of the, what do we say the Israelites are, right? Nubian, Nubian e Egyptian or Egypto-Nubian. That's the best way to put it. If you want to say what the Israelites are academically, they are Egypto-Nubian. So you, if you see someone who looks Egypto-Nubian, let them know that that is a monophylactic group of what looks like a combination of groups that started to become Israelites. That's something that's important to know in that land. But a lot of them were starting to be dispersed, leaving that land. That's important. But other places like Sidon had different types of phenotypes, culture types, different types of culture types. We know that also because the Philistines, which we found just recently, the genetic Philistines, they have a different phenotype, culture type. They're totally different than the Israelites. So remember, remember, remember what we had went over. So the amount of information we went over, we can try to make a short video of it and compress it down, which that's something that I do plan on doing. But the reason why we did all that live is so that it can be witnessed that not only do we have the information, but it's presentable. We'll present it. We'll let others t uh, t touch it, t feel it. No one came up and said, no, this is not true. This is not that only thing that people say is that I have a different theory or that theory is that something that's established how, from where, from when. It's not, if it's not established off of, like we established it, from the foundational facts, from the actual academic papers, and from the verified sources, then they're going off of modern media. So modern media is the agreement of men. Remember that. If they go by the agreement of man, they're wrong. So if they have an agreement of man, just let it be. Because the agreement of man is, is going to be how it's going to be. If you believe, if you know your Israel, you've seen the facts, you know your Israel. There's no need to argue with anyone else, right? You are what you are. And if you know that you're, you're brought in, you're one with Israel, you have united yourself with this Israel, amen, right? You're not blessed real Israel. Unite with real Israel. And that's what we're, we're going to do. We're going to find real Israel, move through the motions of it, to the process of the of the changing of the land until they become a dispersed individual people that basically are what they are today. The reason why this is important, because from Israel, right, because at this time Messiah wasn't here yet, but from Israel it's going to be something that's important, right? Yep, that's right. They changed the migration maps. That's right. Yep, yep. That's that's deep. That's deep. That's definitely deep. That's definitely deep, I would say, without a doubt. For example, during the time of the Iron Age, right, it is going to be a change. So the, the maps, some locations and some names change. So that does happen. That, that's going to be something that we're going to note. 
what changes, what nations come there, what groups are going to come there. Because one of the major things that changed from the Assyrians and Babylonians starts to become a more, what's the thing I'm looking for? A group moves downwards that are more Indo-European. Larger and larger Indo-European starts sweeping in the land. And the reason why I say that because you got the Scythians coming down. They're going to be basically Eastern Steppe or even Western Steppe in the European. And that's where you get Galatia and even some of the places that's on the map uh, where the Scythians were literally settled at. So there are certain places that will actually be important. But we'll also notice that it will be in the area of Syria. So Syria is going to be kind of interesting throughout all of history. We're going to kind of connect that because I don't see a lot of times people connect the Syrian groups with the Israelite groups because they play a major story with Israel, Syria. Syria is majorly important to Israel. So Damascus, Syria, these are going to be majorly important. They're going to kind of give us a, a major tie to all these things. But let's let's look at this route real fast while we're while we're on this. Yep. Let's let's go into some things like that. Interesting thoughts we need we need to go into. Yep, that's right. We got we got to get into these facts. So when they when they came out of the lands of Egypt, right? So we verified it. Let's make sure let's make sure and announce it with our words that we did verify. It. So we're going to say it blunt. We're going to say it blunt that we verified that without a doubt, there is a high probability that the original and ancient Israelites did have a Egypto-Nubian affinity. That means that they have a kind of a Negroid style, but that also can mean that we have to just look at what other groups will be tied in them. Now, that's just interesting and important so we can find who they are pinpoint Lee, because it's gonna it's gonna give a good understanding to what we're seeing today, and it's gonna make a lot of sense a lot of sense when we go through the time frames and the time ranges and start finding certain interesting groups and interesting places that kind of puts things together. So we we're gonna need to find those Egypto Nubians to see where they're going to go. But remember, just like the scripture tells us in the story, as we see here, it says the borders of the promised land and the tribes of Israel. So we can see what we first get. Remember, they came out of the land of Egypt. First one they hit is Edom, right? They go past that and they go all the way up to here, right? They go all the way up to here. They have their little event. And then sooner or later with um, how you say Joshua, they cross Jericho. They enter into the land of the, the Canaanites. So that's when you start getting pinpoint nations like those Canaanites, those Philistines and stuff like that. You got to find those nations and then those nations are going to kind of tell that that tie of all that. He goes to Jericho and I and different areas. And then you start getting a nation settled around. Right. Judah's going to be in that lower area. That's going to be important that we know that Judah is in that lower area where the Dead Sea is. Right. So he's going to be inside on the other side of Jordan where the Dead Sea is. So we're right in this little area. So we're going to not on the other side of Jordan, but inside of the land, but not all the way in the corner right here. So kind of like in a center area. So that's going to be kind of interesting. So that's why we one of the best places we found was Lachish. Right. Witness that Lachish was that one that we found the Egypto Nubian affinity. And there's also been a lot of brothers who did studies on it. And they also had connect different groups of Egyptian groups that had ties and other groups. So it's, it's kind of interesting on what we're finding there. So that's going to be like a real Judean state or city rather. So that's going to be an area where we actually would have real Jews. That's interesting because it lets us know that some of the studies that we had touched on, they're very, they're very pinpoint. They're very pinpoint to the cities of the Jews. Right. Because it's one thing to find like some random offshoot city that they said Jews were at. But it's another thing to find a city that the Bible says Jews were at and in the, the exact time frame of that time frame. So we know that 
the biblical narrative is is real. We know that it's a real story that's told, and it has a complex narrative. But what is also really interesting is that it also ties into genetics because of its story, right? It doesn't just tell you that it's just a story of spirits and movements of things that we can't touch or feel, but it's telling you that there was a nation that invaded a nation and settled in the land. And that's just sim making it simple, you know? So our evidence will actually be to find that evidence of a conquest and a settlement. And that's why a lot of people, they already found all those things. There's a lot of evidence for basically the conquest and everything, right? There's a lot of, a lot of evidence for the conquest and destruction of those things. For example, going back to this note, when we had touched on these things, just to kind of point this out real fast, when we think about the conquest of that, of that land. A little later, right, a little later after the Israelites had took the land and everything, one of the biggest things to prove that it was a, it was a city, not just a city, but a, a territory with a civilization that would be considered Israelites is to find who destroyed them. Right. Because the interesting thing about the Bible is that it's willing to, to write about its faults, It's willing to write about the faults, not that it's the faults of God, but the faults of the people that the people end up getting into it and messing up. And then they got besieged a couple times. So this this paper was actually really interesting. This one of the past um, December 2, 2022. And basically, on December 2nd, when they brought this out, they were talking about the evidence of what happened in that land. So remember, we had looked at Lakish and what was happening there. But we know that there was a couple different things that were taking place in the land. Lots of different nations going through and things like that. But I wanted to just play a little bit of this article so you can see a little bit what it's saying here. It's kind of interesting. Just to know what's, what's going on with this thing. Earth's magnetic field confirms biblical stories of destruction, big think. Membership fees apply after free trial. Cancel any time. Can I be real for a second? That goal you have to exercise just, and eat better? I'm going to just turn that really down. Do but I'm going to just let it read or I'm going to just read it. Because it's what it, basically what you're seeing here is the real destruction later in the book of Kings. Like 2 Kings and in different people like Isaiah. Right. And this is just this is just going to be like a connection with the Babylonian layer, the Syrian layer, which has some interesting ties, I think. All right. Within the grounds of Tel Zafet National Park. Now it is an archaeological dig, nothing but burned mud bricks, a crumbling break in the city's defenses and weapons cobbled together at the last minute from animal bones. What happened here? What force brought this great city to its end? According to the Bible, Gath was one of the main Philistine cities and the home of Goliath the giant. Its destruction is glossed over, described in less than one verse of the Bible, in the book of 2 Kings. Archaeologists have longed to figure out what happened to the ancient city of Gath, and just as important, what happened. But dating sites like this is no straightforward task. Recently, a team of scientists led by Yov Vaknin of Tel Aviv University tried a new method to date archaeological digs like Gath. Magnetic field. Their results recently appeared in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Pole reversal. Deep within the Earth, thousands of miles below the crust, lies the boundary between the planet's solid inner core and the molten outer core that surrounds it. That boundary burns at 6,000 degrees Celsius, hotter than the surface of the sun. It is the hottest place on Earth. In the outer core, massive currents of molten iron convect in giant cells around the inner core. Imagine water boiling on your stove, only on a much larger scale, and warmed by superheated liquid rock. This rock is made up of iron and nickel, and its motion creates the Earth's protective magnetic field. We can thank that magnetic field for a lot of things, including life. It helps shield the Earth, deflecting radiation up and around the planet. It protects our planet from solar winds. And All right, I'm going to pause it because 
I'm gonna just pause it right there. That's, that's that's good enough. So what it's talking about is it's talk about the different ways that you can actually find the evidence of the biblical narrative, right? So even though they even though they say a a place that the biblical narrative was talking about, right? Gath, right there. They said it was it was it was just talked about really shortly and besieged. But you know, a lot of these nations, they really like, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? They like history, I guess. And there's and one of the biggest things is that the Bible enters into history. It's not that God didn't exist outside of history. It's just that the Bible, the written narrative of the Bible, and the the, the movements of Abraham directly or like the pinpoint historical movements are going to be during the time of like the Bronze Age. Like everything else is like kind of like writing in on transitioning in. And then the Bible begins in this historical time frame. And then without a doubt, in the Iron Age, Israelites are like solid in the picture. They're like, there's no doubt there's Israelites there. They're interacting with even nations like Gath, which are actually like the Sea Peoples and stuff like that. So it's kind of it's kind of interesting to know the ties of these different nations and stuff. So Gath is going to be kind of like a Canaanite city and whatnot, but also ties with some of the rebellious groups that Gath actually has a lot of um, stuff in it. It actually has a lot of stuff that goes on in it. It, it only talks a little bit of its destruction, but it has a lot of different events that happen at Gath. But this is, a, this is what I really want you to look at right here. This one right here. To use this data, the team gathered the information, basically the mud bricks, mud, mud bricks uh, held about the direction and just talks about basically how it measured it and everything. They're basically, I, I want to basically make it make sense for those who may not understand. They're looking at the area, they're looking at the mud, they're looking at the layers, and they're scanning the room. And this is what they basically found out. In 700 BC, the, this is what happened in the Syrian com, com, campaign. This is what it says. This is what the, the, the person says. It says, when the historical sources and the archaeological record match, so this was really interesting. He said, when the historical sources, so what's the, what are the, wait, what is he calling a historical source here? This is what, this is what we got to understand. When, when scientists or when people who are scholars start to point out what's a historical source, it's really interesting when you realize that they're using the Bible. You got to, and a lot of people don't notice that even when they were trying to find the Philistines, they were using the Bible. Dorothy Garad, when she was trying to find the Natufians, she was using the Bible. There's all types of archaeologists that use the Bible to find actual archaeo work, right? But let, let's continue and see what it's, what it's talking about. It says, more than 1,000 arrowheads found in the destruction of Lachish. So not only did we find like bones and stuff there, but they found also arrowheads, for example, right? Bingo. We have an archer. So no doubt. How can you find it if there was a war? How do you find it if there was an archer? You find the evidence of the archery. You find the evidence of the bows. You find the evidence, evidence of the arrowheads, right? They found the arrowheads. So there had to be a siege at Assyria, just like the Bible says. The Bible. This is used as a source because it's talking about real events. That means that in our hand, all we have to do is believe. And you know this book has, without a doubt, its own verifications. If you believe this book in your hand that you will have, the Bible, then you, don't, you, you not only have the answers to reality, but you don't, you don't need to verify it. You don't need to verify it. But the great thing is that the, the evidence is there and it's verifiable. That's, what's, that's what happened here. But they go on, they say, they just talk about some a couple of different archers and everything, that a bunch of different archers. So what's interesting is they can time the arrowhead. So they find different arrowheads and different layers and everything. That's great because that's how we can find out if we're looking at the right time frame or not, right? <clears throat> so we got to make sure that's one of the things about a lot of these um, cities and stuff. They be in tails and stuff, for example, right? This one right here just goes on and talks about a little bit right here. This is talked about earlier destruction layer, but it goes on and talks about one of the ones at Beth Shemesh. 
suggesting destruction at the hands of uh jo Joas, right? Joas, right? The king of Israel. So they're saying it, uh, there had to be a destruction by that king of Israel, right? And the team, right? Geomagnetic dating showed a timeline consistent with the this interception. They also found that the Babylonian conquest in Judea was likely forced on Jerusalem. So this is something that we know that the layers, right? This is 2022. And they're, they're looking at all the layers and they're finding the uniform destructions by the Israelites. Because remember, who were also fighting the Israelites and the Judeans, the Judeans and the Israelites were fighting each other. That's why looking at this map, right? Not this one, but the, the one we were just looking at earlier. We got to note that divide. Because that's going to be important also when looking at what happens in that land. Because Israel, you know, they all end up settling their lands, right? You can follow which scriptures and what happens in the, in the book of Judges, right? In the book of Judges, a lot of different events happen in the land of Israel. So it keeps you realizing that they're all settled in this little land of Israel, right? But one of the, one of the best things to know about Judges is that Judges also tells you the limitations of that land. When it tells you like where they settled and stuff and whatnot. That's going to be very important. But a lot of times in all those places, they went into captivity. A lot of those places, they went, they end up going to captivity and end up being pushed basically out into going into captivity again, settled in different areas, being pushed out, back and forth. But if we look at, for example, this map, we can notice the separation of the Israelites, right, of Israel and the upper area of Israel. But they all are Israelites. But this is going to be like the of Samaria and Israel. And the Judeans, or some that were starting to call themselves Jews, a mix of Benjamin, Levi, and pretty much that's what would be it. And some of the some of the Israelites that that kind of blend in with them, right? Some of the some of the some of the Israelites. But during that division, most of the ten tribes had went up into the areas of the northern tribes. So that was something that actually had caused a major um, problem with all that. But this is a, this is just something that basically tells us that indeed is this is this is something that and is it is indeed true. So that we when we're looking at those different destruction layers, we're looking at real evidences, and when we're looking at the Bible, we're looking at a historical book that we need to kind of get a good understanding of what's happened there. But remember, all of this when they were in this land was prophesied that it was going to happen that they were going to end up becoming corrupt, and they were going to end up going and leaving the Most High. And that was going to be the most important thing about the separation of it all. You know, it's going to give us the biggest key of it all. So major, major, major stuff that we have to go into when we go into the transition of the Iron Age into the events of the last unfolding all the way until the fall of the Second Temple. So that's going to be the next phase, the next playlist to go into is that we're going to go into basically the Iron Age, all Iron Age stuff. That's going to be the goal. So the goal is going to be like pinpoint Iron Age stuff. So think about it. Even the reason why, too, is because of prophecy, because iron and clay, right? If we're in the time of iron and clay. So we can also understand this by prophecy. Right. Let me just point something out with Daniel. All right. Because I don't know. I don't know how everyone feels about Daniel. But Daniel is a prophet. Right. Daniel is a verified, solid prophet. And all his works is needed to be understood to this day. For example, let me let me show you a note that I was making, just to kind of get an understanding of some things. This is this is an older note, but we need to understand some things. All right, all right. Let me point out something real fast, as I think these things are quite important to know about. You know, we always have great schisms going on. So it's nice to get the solid, ver ver verified truth. All right. So everyone usually knows about this little image, the statue of Daniel. But let's kind of break down some understandings why it's important to know this image and also why it plays a part at the beginning of the Babylonian rise, as we were just reading, when the Babylonians besiege it because that's when Daniel is actually writing about these. So he first writes about a first kingdom of gold. 
Then he writes about another kingdom of silver. Then he writes about a kingdom of basically brass. Then he writes about a kingdom of iron. It's interesting that, you know, scholars today chose, however it may be, probably from the different iron material that's being used to call the Iron Age, Iron Age. So that's probably what they call it from mix of the iron. But it's interesting how the Most High also chose that, that he chose the last one being iron. So he chose the last one being in the replica replication of iron. Now, obviously, we know the Iron Age was there for a long time. This doesn't mean that this represents the Iron Age. But it's like the last end. The, the Romans are like the end of the Iron Age. They're, like, they're actually like the strongest piece before the end of the Iron Age. They're like the last piece. And they're the ones that actually, in fact, are there for a long time. So the Romans, they're kind of like off the corners of the world until they hit the picture when they defeat the, the Greeks and start to go into the Levant. And what's interesting about the Romans is just that that massive mix of just culture. That is just a culture that just, they're, they're Romans. They clear themselves Romans. They're different than Greeks. They're different than these other ones, even if they're the same genetically. It's the culture. It's the practices. It's their, their worship of Caesars and things like that, if you happen in. But this is what was going on. In the lands of, of Rome would be the mass of iron and clay that starts to form. So iron does play a major part in history. So iron is going to play a major part in the history of the Bible and in our in major history. So that's going to be something that we, we just got to go into. We're going to have to go into it because it's going to be, what's the word I'm looking for? That important. It's going to be that important that we go into to break it down. So we're going to go for the transition of this whole, all of this, right? From this whole transition of these kingdoms. But the, the most important thing to understand when going through these transitions is the understanding of, what's the word I'm looking for? The major thing that the Most High wants you to understand about the transitions of these kingdoms, right? That's that's what we're gonna go through. It's like what's the major, what's the major importance, right? What makes that culture that that way, and what was the importance that what the Most High wanted Israel to know? The main important thing, the main important thing to know is that when you start trying to talk genetic studies with the invasions at that time, it's not gonna be easy, right? It's not like you're going to find a place that is, they said this was a city fort of a hold of the Israelites. No, they were just in captivity in almost all over those places. So when the Babylonians hit there, the probability of finding an Israelite from the time of the Babylonians to before Jerusalem was built or even when Jerusalem was built, because they only went to that city. That was one of those things to understand that when the Jews came back, they came back to Jerusalem. And they was basically settled there before they start branching out and everything. And also for the fact that, you know, no one can dig the ground of Jerusalem today, right? There's no excavations happening pinpoint in the land of Jerusalem that we can pull up the bodies and get the pinpoint genetics because of the religious, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Protectiveness that's going on there. But we can still do some work around and we can still pull up some 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 Jews because we do have some Jews in the Hellenistic time frame. We got some some black haired Jews that were some of them were crucified by the Greeks and things like that. But we did have we got some evidence of what happened with some of those um, things that happened with the Jews at that time. So that's gonna it's gonna be kind of important. So that's during but that's during the time of the Greeks, which is that's still gonna be included in this. So the time frame of uh, say like. 800, 700, right? Going to, what would say like 600, somewhere around there. The transition, the transition of Assyria to Babylon to the transition of Rome, right? When Rome comes there and it finally just, it takes down the city and everything. That's going to be kind of important to look at when, we, when we're talking about this. So Rome is going to be kind of important. Now on this, on this, I don't know why... This also got got to be careful. I got I just realized something. This is one of the most controversial things when it comes to Rome. When did Rome actually fall? Right? Did it actually fall in the third century? Did it fall after the barbarian invasion? Right? 
No, that's not where Rome fell. That's one of the biggest things. I make sure I also uh, verify that because Rome actually fell later on because when Rome was hit by the, the barbarian invasion, the western part of Rome fell, but the eastern part of Rome stayed going at least to 1450, was it 353, when the Ottomans came there and invaded, and that's when Rome actually fell. So that's going to be kind of important to note that Rome continued for a long time, continued for a very, very long time until it finally fell to its final, final um, stage. And, and that's when we got iron and clay. I believe that the Ottomans, Islam, Muhammad, all those things has ties to the final stage of the finals of kingdoms because they are the ones that have the most ties to when you tie the story of Antichrist and everything, it comes together without, without a doubt. That's one of the biggest things that I see when it comes to scripture. You gotta be careful to note who takes who. So remember, it all is in perfect sequence. Babylon is taken by media Persia, right? The academic, academic, or how you say that? The, get back to where it was at. So Babylon taken by media Persia, and then media Persia taken by Greece, right? Greece taken by Rome, and then who takes Rome and it's official, right? Some say about the, the barbarians, some say the Turks, right? It could be both. The barbarians and the Turks took down Rome, right? Because the Ottoman Empire, those trace back to the Seljuk Turks. The Seljuk Turks ultimately trace back to Gog Turks. Those are Turks, right? So, and then the ones who took over the western part of Rome that became the quote unquote Holy Roman Empire, those were barbarians. So, barbarians and Turks kind of take hit that right there. So, that's kind of like it also expresses the understanding of iron and clay. Because that would be the best expression, genetic expression of iron and clay, truly, if you was to ask me. The barbarian invasion and the Turkish um, cognate, I would say, would be the, one of the best in, impressions of iron and clay, without a, without a doubt, without a doubt. So that's why we, we still see today that the Ottoman or the Turkish groups still control that area which is called the throne of satan because that's the one whoever takes that area everyone who took that area became the next power right when babylon took that area when media persia took the area when grecia took the area when rome took the area they were all major powers and then the ottomans took the area and they kept it for a long time and islam became one of those problematic things in that area right so it'll make me get on the arab slave trade stuff like that so it's really important to understand that these things, right? 650 AD. So we also got to know that when we think about the biblical narrative and connecting it with history, that again, layers and stuff, those are going to be important to know about. So we're going to connect some things. We're going to be doing some things, some things to come. But mo most, most, most of it is going to be scripture. And let me make sure I inform that. Now, we're going to be looking at some like cultures and stuff like that, a lot of things like that with it. But we're going to be mostly looking at scripture and the illustration of it and breaking down the importance of the locational movements of them and things. Because it's going to, it's going to tie all together. All those things are going to tie together, especially when we start connecting Israel and Damascus and the things that happen close to Israel's end. Right? Really close, really close, close to, to Israel end with one individual in particular. Yeah, think about how you spell his name, Rezin, or Rezin, something like that. This individual from Syria, this one's going to be kind of interesting to start getting into. We start seeing him in Isaiah. You'll start seeing him talk about Isaiah right there. For the heads of Syria, for the head of Syria is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin, right? And he just, he just goes on and talk about some things. Because Rezin, right, the Assyrian, the I also ha say that they have genetic ties to Ar Arabians, right? So the Arameans have genetic ties to Arabians. That's something that's really interesting when you start connecting them. They are going to also have ties with Israel. It's going to be important to note is that when I say the nor northern Israel, right? Ephraim, a lot of the nations from the top, they're going to have ties with Syria. So they're gonna Syria and Israel kind of goes back and forth. 
So we're going to kind of point something out that happens with Syria and Israel, that these events are important, connecting Damascus and Syria and the children around that area and what happens in the, these certain events around that time. So this is obviously, like I said, in the time of Isaiah, these are going to be major, major, major groups to look at. The Assyrians, Assyria, different different cultures around. So we're, we'll establish which cultures they were dealing with. Right? We'll, we'll also have to point out the, the the kingdom of many, right? When it talks about later kingdoms that come in, it only talks about it real fast, but it's a real nation. It's a, it's a real nation. Real, real, real nation right here in Ezekiel. Because later on in Ezekiel, he is this a little bit after Isaiah when Jeremiah is alive. But we're going to start seeing this nation, right? Still talking about Syria, throwing in Damascus and everything. And then it's going to talk about certain other nations, right? Like, for, for example, what Jeremiah says, right? Set you up a standard in the land, blow the trumpet, right? Among the nations, right? Prepare the nation against her. Call together against her the kingdoms of Ararat, right? Where Armenia is, many, and Ashkenaz, right? So very, very important. So many, I'll just show it real fast. Many is a real nation, I'll just show it on, on Wiki just to get a real quick thing real fast of it. Here's a here's the place right here. This is pretty much what it is. It's going to be in connection with the Assyrians and Aratu, just to kind of get it out real fast of this little nation and everything. You know, what's also interesting, we, we went into ha a parts of this nation, which has, as it says, when it talks about the Manians were a Hurrian group with a slight Cassite admixture. Now, this is really interesting because we went over the Cassites, right? They have some similarity with the Amorites, but their culture is different. But we also went over the Hurrians, which also have similarity with all of those, though their culture is different. So it's, that's also really interesting. So these, these cultures are really interesting. They're Iranian plateau Caucasus, Zagro Mountain, um, Indo-European group. Um, just kind of get a good understanding on what they are. That's what the scripture was talking about. It's talking about uh, Iranian, a uh, Hurrian, or Eurotrian culture that kind of is going to be important. And it, it, it develops exactly in the time of where the Israelites are and everything. So that's going to be kind of important to note. In fact, Probably on here, maybe I'll talk about some of the history, but it does talk about they deal with real nations around, right? Like the Sumerians and stuff. And obviously Assyria, when the Assyrian inscriptions talk about they was dealing with one of the nations around and everything. And talk about many and other nations like that. So it seems like they that's when they start to pop up in that time. But what's interesting, it says also in the seventh century BC, right? Right before the like, time of the Babylonians and everything, it says many was defeated by the advancing Scythians. So remember, I was talking about that. The Scythians come in. Now, why is all these things important? Because if you want to get into real biblical history, the, the deep complexity of the land and what are all these names in this book? These names ain't just said for no reason. We're getting into some of the stuff that people think is boring. Like all those extra details of all these things. Those are going to be what's going to really seal the deal on how explicitly um what's the word i'm looking for pinpoint these this book is yes. especially to let his people know that he's still here and he's still uh what's the word i'm looking for trying to save them and and also that these things exist this is a real this is some real history right these are real real history but that's that's important so it's going to tie some major nations in the reason why is because the Scythians. We need to examine the Scythians because they come in hard in the New Testament. For example, even the scriptures write about the Scythians, right? It says right here, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian. So Scythian, that's, that is what you're seeing. So it's letting you know that a northern, western, eastern nation came down there in that time. Right, we're gonna pinpoint that. It's gonna also pop up on maps, especially in Sumeria. 
So bond nor free, but Christ is all in all. So that means they were dealing with Scythians, just like how early on in BC time, when the nation of basically many Ararat and Ashkenaz invade the land of the Levant and settle in the Levant for a long time, as long as the Iron Age guys were there. So that's going to be kind of important to note of these groups that later take the northern tribes of Israel and settle in the lands of Levant. But these are this is going to be a real group that's going to be dealing with a lot of people. But just one verse, just one verse basically talks about this nation. Only one, one verse. It, it gets into this nation and it tells us the details of them, right? Right there, Jeremiah 51 and 27, right? Tell us right off that many, right, is going to be a real nation, right? That's going to be very important. Even, even in the Jewish encyclopedia, they write about it. They say, according to basically uh, Pishta. And the uh, Turgum basically says the many of the Bible is they say Armenia or rather a part of the country as Ararat is also mentioned and all that whatnot. So most likely because like we said, it's part of as we had seen the highlands, but we know it's also with like we have went over many times Ashkenaz. That's why we go over this picture. Got to understand the division of this. I mean, very important in ancient in ancient genetics too. It's looking at the the separations of what happens in a Neolithic transition, right? What this is actually what that represents a Neolithic transition before Abraham comes in. How the world looks before Abraham comes in. That's like that's why it says the world as known to the Hebrews. That's a thought of what it would look like before Abraham comes in. The way, the way you know because literally on this thing you can't really see it, but they got literal Akkadians on here. So this one that actually represents Eber represented the Akkadians settled up in this upper area. That's kind of important to kind of get a good understanding of that with that. All right. So that's why it's important to know these names and stuff like that, like Ashkenaz and stuff like that. Right. Very important not to get that mixed up because a lot of people get that mixed up. Ashkenaz, not hard to understand. That's the son of Japheth. But we also got to understand in this area of Iran, where we get this area where we see the Assyrians would, would have been posted at, we would have had many, right, up there in the, in the, in the mountains. So we're going to get some understandings from that, too. So we're going to have to look at their genetics and everything. I already went on the Indo-Iranian or Indo-European branch of Indo-Iranian groups, and I was going to do a live on it, but... Mm, I'm not really sure to do the, the live directly on it. I'm probably going to like infuse it into what we're going over here. So instead of doing just a pinpoint live only on that, more moving with the transition of it because it's mostly around this time frame. But it's, 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 it's important to know these cultures because guess what? Again, process of elimination, right? If you verify what cultures we know, we can find what culture is Israel, right? So one of the biggest things, too, that we had noticed like when we talk on genetics, that EYB1A line, is that we don't find it in actual real physical culture before the Iron Age. So that's important to understand. So it pops up really after the Bronze Age. That's really when it pops up. Exactly EYB1A1. Not EYB1A2, right? Because E1B1A1 and E1B1A2 are twins, right? They pop up about the same time, bronze age, right before the Neolithic transition, right? They're no older than the Natusian uh, Neolithic, Neolithic ones. That's going to be important for where they come from, for where those lines come from, because they're going to come from Syria. They're going to go down into Africa, come out, dwell in the lands of Egypt for a short time, or, well, the lands upper Egypt for a short time. So they're going to go into Africa, come out. They're going to dwell in the lands of basically the African plate area of Levant, right? On the other side of the Jordan, right? So remember, the other side of Jordan is still on the African plate. So that's important. Very important. So they're going to be still in that, that area of that plate, developing there. And as they develop there, there's going to be other cultures that's going to fill that area up, right? The Scythians. Right. Very, very important. It says also the 7th century BC, Matani was defeated by the advanced Scythians. So 
very important culture to kind of bring in to understanding of that 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 culture can't be denied right we can verify the scythians without a doubt but they're going to be existing in that time frame so the scythians pop up that's that's actually the first time they come in is actually when they recorded defeating matani that's when the scythians come in well they there's also recording when they come and attack or scare egypt they come down and scare egypt and egypt kind of like bends their way pretty much and that's that's kind of something that that happens too but that's kind of in the midpoint. So that's this is gonna be a nation we already went over. We already went over the history of this nation that you haven't seen. You just gotta see the one that we went over the right? But notice notice in the Neo Assyrian time frame member, you see the Phoenician area and you see how this area how they reach down into this this area here. You can see as it says Scythian Kingdom in West Asia at its maximum extent. So their kingdom was at a maximum extent. They was a very strong kingdom. So you can see BC time frame. No doubt Scythians were basically stretching down from the area here. So you see the Scythians, right? They would have stretched from here and they would have came from here. So Eastern, Western steppe, Scythians, right? Eastern, Western steppe. Some say they came from this way and went down some and went over here. But they're kind of like moving back and forth through these areas. And when they went down, Right, do the Caucasus, right? Remember, and then they set the unsettle at a, a little area there. They're they're also interacting with the Eritreans, right? Many and everything, and then Syrians, and they also go into this area, right, where the Phoenicians are, right. So that's going to be an interesting guess that comes down into that area, right? So we got we got to account for those groups too. So we got we got a couple groups to account for that's going to tell us who is who. In that land so in a way the more the merrier right because it, it it helps us really understand what's going on in that land just from the complexity because the more complexity the more evidence the more evidence the more you can realize who is who that's going to be really important for getting some understands of that land but that's why i want i wanted to point out some of those interesting nations and why why you might be interested in going deep into the Iron Age information. So not Bronze Age, not Neolithic, not ancient, not, not out of Africa, not, not a, all the ancient things we went over. We're going to get now into the depth, the depth of the Iron Age information, which is a compressed amount of information. So it's a compressed amount of information, but it requires its own um, concentrated studies. That's what it, that's what honestly it does. Because how much information it has, so it requires its own amount of con concentrated studies and everything. But if you have any ideas or anything specific you want to go into, or if you want to look into any of the, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Maybe uh, any different ideas. Like if you want to go into if Israel was in America, if Israel was in Africa, if Israel was in Britain. You know, there's different ideas for people who say, where is Israel and stuff. And, and you want to look into that evidence and see if that's true. Now, like I say, we can verify it in the lands of the Levine. That's the most verifiable and the most academic way to verify it. But we can look we can look at what some misunderstandings on why some people may be saying why some things may be like that. And a lot of times it's actually very simple. A lot of times it's very simple where someone may have gone wrong. Like if someone puts... Jerusalem in the land of America because they think they found some Semitic words where, you, well, you got to verify what branch of Semitic and what time frame of that Semitic and what culture it, it will more be more like. And if that culture has similar things like that, that's something that's very important to go into. Or if that area is going to be from a map of that time frame. So that's important too, to look at a map of that time frame, so that means don't try to find ancient Israel in the Bronze Age by using a map from the Middle Age, right? That wouldn't make no sense. Why would you use an Indo-European map made in the Middle Age to try to find Bronze Age Israel? So we don't want to do that. Even even Herodotus doesn't know that much of the lands of Africa. So all of a sudden. It, Later, Indo-European barbarian invasion never had seen much of Africa. Now they're going to try to tell you what's in Africa. You, you got to understand they're telling you modern updates of what Africa was in Africa, not 
ancient updates. Unless the map, unless the map says this is a map of the land layout of 348 or something like that. That that'd be different. But if they say this is how the world was and the kingdoms that were established during 1842, don't pull up something like Jerusalem. The reason the reason why I say that when I say Jerusalem, put them pull up like there's a place in Africa. Let me just let me show let me show something. Let me just show it real fast what, what I mean. Let me show you how many how many places actually have uh, a Jerusalem. How many places have a Jerusalem? Just to kind of um, show it. So there's there's a Jer Jerusalem in America. So here's Jerusalem in New York, right here. Jerusalem, New York. So don't pull up a map and say there's Jerusalem in New York and say well there's Jerusalem. There's another one in America, another Jerusalem in America in Ohio. Jerusalem in Ohio. So there's a Jerusalem in Ohio. Right they also have a Jerusalem in America in, if I recall, North Carolina. So there's a Jerusalem in North Carolina. So you got a good understanding that that's going to be very clear. That Just because it's called Jerusalem doesn't mean that it's Jerusalem. There's also a Jerusalem in Africa. There's also a Jerusalem in the areas of Africa. If we go to Jerusalem... So here's here's gonna be the normal Jerusalem, but let's go to Jerusalem in the areas of Africa. All right. Here's here's the area. So that one just says Jerusalem African states here, but that's not that's not the land. I'll show you what I mean. Just to kind of point it out, if I can, if I can find it, yes. or how it's worded, I gotta look at it real fast. And the reason why, the re like I said, the reason why I'm showing this is just so it can be understand. Um, I gotta think about what where it is. I think that's it. Is that it? No, it's not it. There's a there's a Jerusalem in Africa. I gotta think about where where is exactly it's in it's in lower Africa. But they keep on taking me to Israel, but that's not the one. There's another one. Let me see. I already got it on one of these since I already looked it up before. Maybe I could find it real fast. Or I probably didn't pinpoint the place. But there's a there's a Jerusalem in Africa. There's a, there's a couple of Jerusalem in different places. The reason why I say that, the reason why I say this is because to avoid those type of um those type of um problems. Let me see. Mm. Maybe we need to put it like that, or somehow, some way. I want, I want to show you this. Let me put it in a piece like that. I want to show you this. I want to show you this. Now I want, now I want to show you it. I want to find it real fast. Just to show you, where is that? I want to download my my Discord because I got I already got the picture in. Oh, here it is, kind of. But this is this is it. Jerusalem is a town in pretty much this little area. Here, maybe I'll, I'll try to copy it. So sometimes, like like stuff like that. The reason why I'm showing that, so and you can see if I if I zoom out. So Jerusalem. So as you can see, there it is right there. That's the area where it's at, at the bottom of Africa. You see right there? So they talk about Jerusalem, that's also in Africa and everything. But, right? 
you got to be careful on those maps. So there it is, Jerusalem in Africa. So this is why this is why I'm saying that. So Jerusalem, South Africa. You see what I'm saying? So that's why you want to you want to look at things scholarly, academically, verify it with the culture, verify the kingdom, verify the maps, verify all those things so that you you can verify it with like academic factual um evidence. So but if someone, you know, if someone has like a different let's say they say uh, Jerusalem over here, right? They say Jerusalem over here, right? It's, it's laughable, laughable. Right? I would more believe Jerusalem in Africa before I believe Jerusalem in America, right? But Jerusalem is actually would be in area here. So Jerusalem would be actually there, but that's for like ten point one. I'll be right there. In between areas of Euphrates, where you have the upper northern nations which there's like abundant of information for the Mesopotamian nations. That's why I say that Jerusalem can't be mistaken because of the Mesopotamian nations and Egypt. Egypt and Mesopotamian nations, because Mesopotamian nations over here, the Kassite, right? All those different um, nations that settled over there, Babylon, Babylon, all that stuff, X1s and whatnot. They all settled in those areas, the Akkadians, right? The Sumerians, these are nations that can't be denied that they, they were settled in those areas. But Abraham leaves out of that area where Habarabi starts to pop up. And then he goes and deals with the lower areas where the Philistines are going down into Egypt. So if he if he's leaving the areas of Syria and he calls himself uh, from areas of Aram, and, he, and he's saying he's leaving those areas of Ur and all those areas, then he's going down to the areas into Egypt, right? And then he goes out. So that, that's what's important about understanding these land mass and whatnot. But I'll leave it like that for now, family, as we're just having a holy conversation today. So to the next moves, what's the next moves? What's the next thing we're going to do? It's going to be Iron Age information. So mostly Iron Age information. That doesn't mean we won't point out like any ancient information if, the, if that comes up, but that's what we're going to be mostly doing, touching on the biblical narrative. So getting more into the scriptures, onto the pinpoints of information, or sometimes parts of the scripture that people probably don't go into, like the details. Sometimes there's also in-betweens that are finished by the history or the archeology span that finishes what happened. Just like how I said, Gaff was destroyed. There's more history to that. We know that there's extra history pretty much outside the Bible to what happened to a lot of these nations. So that's one of the biggest things, but the, the following of this narrative is of tracing the Israels. That's why the Bible is amazing. Because though we can't find a lot of them arche by archaeal evidence, we can find them by the word and verifying it by archaeal evidence. So verifying their interactions with certain kings and everything. So like we had went over before, we'll have evidence of them in the land of pretty much upper areas where media is and Babylon and stuff like that. And then they're spread down to Africa and to many coastal areas especially the areas of the Nile, going down the Nile, and down into even areas of West Africa, early, very early. So that's gonna be something that's important to note because most of the Jews are gonna be settled in Alexandria of Egypt. So Alexandria is taken by the time of Alexander the Great. So that's gonna be kind of important. So that's gonna be major, major stuff you're gonna look at, some interesting stuff. So other than that, if anyone got any questions or statements or any, any highlights of that let me know otherwise with that family i gotta make sure i say the lord's prayer i'm gonna say, i'm gonna pray over you family because that's also what i've been doing my free time make sure i pray for the brothers and sisters that believe in the most high he's holding on these times these hard times because you don't know what's tomorrow what tomorrow's gonna bring you know so i just want to pray for you our father in heaven honor be thy name May thy kingdom come, may thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us on a righteous path and guard us from the evil. In your name is Father. Amen. Amen, amen, family. May you, may you put on strength. May you stand with the most high. And may you finish the race and finish all tasks that are in your hand. Everything, don't, don't, Put anything at rest until you say that I feel at, at rest. So I feel like you feel like everything that you were supposed to do is finished. So go ahead, 
and make sure you know get a nice read of the word because that's what we're going to do we're going to get really deep into the word as this is what we do so with that family may you be blessed may you be beloved and amen